Hi everybody, I'm here with Dennis Murin, the Senior Visual Effects Supervisor and Creative Director at ILM. Dennis, thank you so much for being on the show. Sure, yeah. Yeah, welcome here. back. Last week, uh, you asked if you could answer some questions from the fans. Sure. So we're just gonna get started. All right. And uh, All right. Cheese, could you bring the questions over, please? Thanks, buddy. So our first question is from Iron Golem 101. How did you get the job at ILM? I was living in LA and was in my mid 20s and heard that George Lucas was doing the science fiction film and I'd never met him and, and I always loved movies. So I tracked down somebody who I heard was working on it and was doing the effects that I'd met once before and that was John Dykstra. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were just starting up and I asked to see if I could maybe get some work on it as a camera guy or whatever, or effects camera guy, and he said, come on over, and I did an interview, and that was it. So I, I walked into a place that I'd never been to, work with people who I'd never worked with before, and uh, to meet George, and it was a, just a great experience and changed my life. Before that, your background coming into coming into ILM, the stuff that got you the job, is you had a background in stop motion animation. I, in, in effects of all types. In all types. All types. I've been doing this since I was literally like six years old mm -hmm. with a still camera shooting miniatures and explosions and stop motion and force perspectives and stuff like that. Then I got a movie camera when I was 10 and uh, all through high school, junior high school, everything uh, just did effects and had a really, I, I, I developed this in my mind a way to really sort of pre-visualize stuff because you had to do it those days because there'd be a week before you'd see your, the senior shot. You had to send it away and get it back again. So I, I was sort of like pretty much up on this stuff when Star Wars came along. I'd been doing it really as a hobby, but f I developed a lot of skills in those years. And so you had a reel to show, like this is, I, yeah. this is what I've done. I had a reel to show, it was all funky because the technology was from the old days. Mm -hmm. And they were developing brand new technology, which is why I wanted to work on it also, to see what this new technology was I, that I'd heard about, but never actually had a chance to use it. So what inspired you when you were, uh, when you were a kid? What, what, what made you want to make movies? You know, uh, I remember seeing films when I was like five, six years old, the special effects films from like Ray Harryhausen and... Uh, you know, disaster movies, War of the Worlds, and those things. I was just hooked on those movies, and I have no idea why. And I'd go home and try to recreate scenes from those movies in, in my yard and with photo cutouts and stuff like that. And I've got no idea why I just love that stuff, and I always have. And I self-taught. There were no classes. There were really no books, no magazines. There were any way to learn it. So you just learn, you know, nothing to read. And in L.A., there were like, six of us in all of LA that really were interested in this stuff in those days. In, uh, this is like in the, in the late 50s, early 60s. And we found each other eventually, especially when we were old enough to drive and get a car. <laughs> kind of necessary Yeah, It is, yeah. it is, very much. It's hard to get your mom to drive you, you know, <laughs> 35 minutes every day to meet a friend or something and vice versa, you know. But eventually we found each other and that we sort of taught each other how to do the work based on movies we'd seen. And, uh, and that was, just, that was kind of it, you know, just doing it over and over and over again. I read somewhere that you, that you just found Ray Harryhausen in the book and called him up. Yeah, Ray Harryhausen was in the L.A. phone book, and there were a number of other people. Bill Abbott was in the phone book, who did the, the effects department. Uh, my mom knew somebody who had worked at Paramount as a grip, and I called him up, and he'd worked on War of the Worlds. And it's like, oh, my God, he worked, actually, I'm talking to somebody who worked on War of the Worlds. Uh, Howard Lidecker, who I liked his his explosions and stuff he'd done at Republic Pictures. He was in the phone book. So, and these guys, all of them were thrilled to have anybody call at all interested in their work because nobody cared. Really? And nobody, right. There was no interest, there was no future in it. They weren't making effects films or anything. So they get a call from, you know, like a 13 year old kid and okay, come on over if you want to, sure. I don't know what, and I'd go through someone's garage and he'd have these props from a film he had done or something and I might recognize it. And I'm talking to like Howard Lightecker who I'd seen his work on TV and stuff and it's just amazing. Everybody was very nice and very open. You know? it's, it's so funny how you talk about there being no future in it and yet that job that you got at ILM is now still going. Right, and there was no future at that time. That I thought, and we all thought, that was a two-year job. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, Ken Ralston and I were the ones that had worked sort of a lot on films before and sort of tracked 
these things. And there were these little two-year blips where there'd be a certain type of movie made and be gone again. And I thought that's what was going to happen here. And here we are 40 years later and they're still <laughs> doing them. And I'm still involved in it. So uh, that brings us to our next question from Boston Peterson. Were you thinking that the special effects in Star Wars A New Hope was going to revolutionize film? Did you think you were really on to something when you were working on that? I didn't think so. No. Uh, I was thrilled to work with George and thrilled to work with the, with the gear and the crew was wonderful. They were a whole different type of people, person than I was. Car racers and stuff like that, and movie guy, real, real machinists and stuff like that. I just thought it was going to be a one-off and that was sort of it. And I didn't, couldn't tell if the film was going to be any good or not. Because, you know, we never saw much of the live action. George didn't show it to us. And he was off shooting in England. And when he was back, he was just talking to us about the effects. And he just, he would just say the shot. Here's the shot, you know. This is the trench. And, you know, the trench model's over there. And here, put an X-wing in it. And then followed by two TIE ships and flying down like this. And say, okay, yes, sir, yes, sir. And uh, the models were all around. And you kind of just shot the pieces. And then the optical guys over there, you know, assembled them into a shot. And we did that for a year, and we had, you know, out comes this movie, and we thought, I thought, that's great, you know, and I wish it would happen again. No idea that this thing was going to be a huge hit. No idea at all. Uh, there were two or three people working there at the, at the Oil Island. We probably had 50 people. These guys said, this is going to be huge. Mm -hmm. And they went, they're the guys that went out. One was, a, one was a driver there and bought stock in 20th Century Fox and all this stuff. I had no clue, and most of us had no clue. But some did, and they were right on the money. And, but even then, to think it would keep going is unbelievable, that it's just gone on. And so many movies now have got these huge effect sequences. I, you know, I think my generation grew up, I guess, with television and, and liking graphics on television because there was mm -hmm. early stuff going on. Flipping the channel so our attention span got shorter. We passed that right on to our kids. They passed it on to their kids. And now you've, you've got you know, two massive effects films coming out every week practically, that, uh, and the audience just seems to want to see more and more and more. So it's extraordinary how everything has changed. The expectation from audiences has changed so And, and the, the industry's changed. I mean, I did some work at commercials for a while, and, and you know, I went in one day, and there were all these attractive women sitting there you know, for an audition. But what they were doing is they were auditioning their hands, because their hands were going to be holding an M&M chocolate. The mm -hmm. hand was going to hold the M&M chocolate. That's what they cared about. Where do you see that now? Where do you see the hand models at no, all? No, now the M&Ms are yeah. running around and dancing. Right, and they're all over the place talking, doing everything, you know, yeah. backflips and, and multiplying or whatever's going on. So the whole industry has changed and, and the stuff that I had to learn on my own, you can, you can buy books about it, you know, and, mm. and do it in your home and do far better work than I could ever do in my day, which is good. Keep, keep changing, though. It's, things have got to change. So you, you took that, that knowledge that you, that you built by just going out and doing it yourself and, and talking to, to whatever professionals you could get a hold of. Right, right. And you went into to Star Wars, which had this new technology of the computerized camera motion. Right. How did handheld camera translate into the computer stuff that started happening? You know, that came probably from George having us follow footage that he'd taken from movies and from... Uh, newsreels of real World War II footage or World War I footage even. And those would have a handheld look to them sometimes. So because he knew you couldn't explain this to him, he couldn't explain the dynamics, you could do a storyboard, but that didn't have any time component to it. That he found these shots in advance for movies and sort of plugged them in and built the sequence and then showed those shots to, and then took them apart. He said, here's the, here's the shot. So we wouldn't just be looking at a storyboard, we'd be looking at actual running footage, say, from the Dam Busters, a movie like that, or from a World War II film that was made by John Ford, maybe, documentary showing a, a plane flying along and blowing up and the camera like trying to follow it, something like that. Mm -hmm. So we were just, we would put those things into it. So, and that's part of what makes that show, I think, work, and a lot of the stuff that's going on work, is that it's not really all planned out. I mean, he took these pieces from different play things and put them together and made a movie that was like totally unexpected, almost from shot to shot, because his sources were, were came from different places. So there was there was a certain amount of uncontrolled that was going on that comes through when you see the movie, 
that is like a combat situation that's uncontrollable when you when you in any sort of combat thing. So you've got this big battle at the end of Star Wars, and you've got these telephoto lens shots and wide angle shots and shaky shots and locked off shots and stuff. You, if you were just designing this from scratch, you'd make it very cinematic. Mm -hmm. And it would all be planned out and it would look pretty, ar probably artificial. And that's the way almost all effects movies had been done up until that time. So I think that's why you sort of were, thought you were seeing a movie and it was familiar. And then George comes along and you're seeing something that's is fresh and new and young, you know, and bold. And uh, then we got a chance to work on it, not even realizing at the time, you know, what we were doing or what he, had, that, what he was bringing to it. It wasn't until we saw it with an audience. And there's such a great deal of trust there in that not knowing, but being really committed to the uh, to the idea. I mean, for him. Yeah. Yeah, we were just doing the job, and that was great. For him, it was not only trust, it was a boldness. Yeah, I mean, to, risky. Risky, man, to go in and be able to say, I'm going to do this, and trust himself and uh, all the naysayers. I guess there were a lot of naysayers around. Um, but it was, you know, it was amazing. I didn't know if the stuff was ever going to work at all. I was also thinking this technology is so complicated. You know, I could take a model and put it on a couple of wires and sh in front of a blue screen and slide it down and we get the shot in two hours. Well, we would have gotten something, <laughs> but it would not. It would have been familiar, like a toy, no mm -hmm. matter what we did, and it wouldn't have had the confidence that this motion control rig gave us when we were shooting those models, because we could put we could put ourselves into those movements. And the way those spaceships move. So we look at the storyboard, and we look at the footage, and the shots are designed absolutely. I want the ship to go from here to here with that sort of degree of excitement and energy. We could literally program that into the camera moves and into the backgrounds. So I think that everything looks very solid. It doesn't look like it's accidental. It looks in that it, film, and it and it looks it looks real. It looks yeah. like something real that's being filmed. I guess so. I yeah. never thought so. But other people have said <laughs> it looks real to me. I've seen all these mechanical kind of artifacts that are just that go along with the movie. Yeah. Well, that's did the you way ever spaceships move? I mean, do you feel knows? like you know too much about it to, to to watch it that way? You mean Star Wars? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I from the first Castle Crew screening, I it was kind of like, wow. I but still, you know, I don't know. everybody would come out saying it's phenomenal. <laughs> so I said, well, if we just done that shot a little better. <laughs> AJ Minotti asks. Was there a time that there was an attempt at a high-tech solution that failed and then a low-tech solution became the right way to do it? Uh, there was talk at the beginning of the walker sequence to build real robotic walkers that would actually walk. And I just thought that was a really, really bad idea because it would be like building a, another complicated camera motion control system if it was actually going to be sort of moving. And I just pushed, you know, we shouldn't do this. You know, it's a bad idea. We've got this horrible deadline. The movie's got to get done. Let me do it stop motion, because I knew that, I knew the people that could do it, and George said, fine, and that's, at least that's my memory of it. And uh, I just set it up the way that, that uh, all the, you know, King, the original King Kong had been set up and stuff with big painted backgrounds, and you can put the puppets in front of them, and you can light them correctly and tweak them, because that stuff has to be lit and, and the photographed perfect to look really, really super good. Mm -hmm. The trade-off is... You don't have any map lines or funny stuff going on that you could get, you know, and make things look fake. But it, that walker sequence was so hard, I wanted to be able to see it through the camera and just have it look perfect to get the lighting right and the angle right and everything else. So that was really an old school technology or, old, you know, that we brought, uh, that we used in that film that I think really helped. And that sort of jerkiness uh, on the stop motion made everything look more like machines, which they were supposed to be, and the walkers were machines. Yeah, it gives them this really great mechanical effect, yeah, the way that right, they're moving. Right, instead of this yeah. sort of fluid kind of thing that you would have probably had. So Jacob Smith asks, what's the biggest challenge you've faced in your career? You know, there's so many of them on every project, but I was thinking of from a, sort of an overview, mm -hmm. it's trying to make the work look new and fresh. And it's hard to find a look to impose on stuff where it's kind of been done many times before. And often you luck out, like we had the speeder bike chase in Jedi. How to get that to look like you're really going 100 miles an hour through a forest was a pretty tough thing to make. And then to put the bikes in and make it look like it's, you know, it's all, it's a kinetic, it's got a feel to it. That sort of the steady cam solution for part of it, which is a guy holding a camera, literally walking slowly through the forest so you don't see the path because he's not walking on a path. That added a kind of a jerkiness to it that gave it a lot of energy. That was unexpected, but gave it that new look that wouldn't have happened if we'd had total control on it. And so that was like an accident 
that that mm -hmm. worked out, but it did give it this fresh look. And I think it's just hard to often find a fresh, a fresh way of looking at something, especially now with so many of these films being done. We have a question here from Mr. Bob A. Feet. Oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what was the most painfully rewarding special effect or special effects you have worked on? It's Empire Strikes Back. And mm. that was the hardest thing I've ever done. It was far beyond what Star Wars was as far as the effects go. Many more shots, much more complicated with the light backgrounds, the snow backgrounds and the cloud backgrounds. So the matting had to be better. So many more designs had to be done for it. So many different types of things between the walkers and the asteroid sequence. I mean, just the asteroid sequence alone, trying to bring clarity to all these rocks that are moving around. And you can't tell one from another, but you want this one to look big and this to look small. And you got a falcon flying through there. You can't tell what you're looking at. I mean, that all had mm -hmm. to be figured out. And that's just one sequence. And there were so many of them. And, and we just barely got that show done. And I remember hearing that there were, uh, in those days we used to put out 70 millimeter prints. It'd be a few of them that would go out, which are great, big quality, super prints that they make. And I think there's 30 prints out that have temporary shots in them, like about 17 temp shots that were unfinished. Were there and, like animatics or no, no, just no, a thank description God. They weren't of that. What, oh, no, okay. no, 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 they, they were <laughs> shot, but they didn't look very good at all. Oh, okay. You know, really the colors mismatched and the map and every, and we just didn't, we couldn't do it. And then, mm -hmm. you know, we got those done like three days later. And so all the rest of them came out fine. But, but those shots are around somewhere. And I remember talking to someone and they said, oh, don't worry. That'll be, they'll be sent to the Midwest or overseas. No one will ever see those prints. And I always wonder, you know. They're out know. there. They're out there. And they <laughs> probably went right to the major cities and. Everybody saw those, and that was terribly embarrassing. Ben Wiles asks, will Dennis Muren be working on more Star Wars films? You know, I'm working a little bit. I'm just sort of consulting, but I am kind mm -hmm. of looking, looking at the dailies and making comments and saying, you know, not wanting to copy the other films, but that there is a world that they need to be in that needs to be true to itself. And, uh, and I'm, so I sort of make suggestions. Sort of like Obi-Wan and Empire Strikes Back and come and, well, it's not ready I, yet. I may be like that. I don't, I don't know if it's like that or not. Or maybe that slug creature that comes out of the, uh, the compact or thing and looks around and goes mm -hmm. back. Whoa, let me out of here. Goes back again. Alexander Stevens asks, from 1976 till today, what moment stands out? during your career so far? Probably a couple. One is it's amazing to be on this Star Wars massive cultural change and during that whole period, you know, it was really after Empire that it really clicked because we knew it would be a done it twice. And then after that, I went on to E.T. and then Jedi and, and it's just kind of kept. So somewhere being part of this, you know, the wave of the culture or whatever they used to call it is pretty amazing to be making all this War, you know, doing what was a hobby, doing it as work, and all these people seeing it was really, a really amazing thing for me that to, to have uh, to go through it and still kind of be going through it. But specifically, probably the as far as effects go, it's the period around the time we were doing Terminator 2 and Jurassic, mm -hmm. when we were really trying to get the CG stuff that had been a promise for so long. We actually managed to wrangle it and get the gear to be reliable and the software to be easy enough to, for people to learn, for human beings to learn how to use it, and flexible enough that, that you could come up with an idea and a tool could kind of give you an image that you wanted, uh, and have it be reliable and be budgetable, because the business we're working in, there's deadlines and budgets and you have to stick to them. It's not like academia, where a lot of the computer stuff came from, where they could work on stuff for year after year. Our stuff had to, had to actually work and had to deliver. So that period in there when we really learned it and sort of proved it on, proved it a little bit on the abyss, for sure on T2, and then the public went crazy when they saw dinosaurs on Jurassic. Mm -hmm. That was really thrilling. And also, just for me, as an effects lover and knowing a lot of the people who've been doing it for years, to, to know how thrilling it would be for all the practitioners, for the, you know, for a hundred years before to have had this tool that, you know, you're not relying anymore on plastics and wood and gravity and wires and accidents and danger, real danger and cutting your hand off or something. It's all your imagination. You can, as long as you can, if you can figure it out, you can, and you've got good people working, you can pretty much do it with the computer. Pretty much make something happen. 
And now it, everything's gotten so much bigger with more shots being done and the shots more complicated and the audience has gotten so fine tuned. It's super hard to make it look real. It was a little easier back then to make it look real. Now we're still struggling with trying to make this stuff look, uh, you know, where the audience just doesn't even see it. And, you know, we, we're doing it. It's coming. You talked about a little bit about how key lighting lighting was for having things on camera and having them read as read as real. What do you think the What do you think the trick is with using the computer tools, getting getting that sense of realism? I think it's it's knowing it's having a goal and and what realism looks like, uh, which sounds silly, but an awful lot of the of the people that that are working in the industry now are right out of school or pretty close out of the school and they never have learned to look around and see things and just look at it and say look at that glare off your nose it's a little brighter than off your forehead if they were making you in cg they might make those two match up and the way it would come out is something looks funny about this and there might be 10 other things that are funny about that too so before you know it, I'll look at you know you and CG, and it's we've lost the moment in the movie. It's amazing how many things we see that we don't realize we yeah, see. Yeah, you you see it in the first like two or three or four years of your life, and then and that's why kids are always curious. I mean about everything, sound, weight, you know, appearance, you know, all sorts of things. And then I think what it is is when you realize it's not a threat, then you're okay. And then after a while, you're not thinking about the look of things; you're looking, thinking about other things, but. I've had to, and, and a lot of you know people who do this stuff, and you know who anyone really who cares about art or about this sort of creativity, has to learn how to observe things. And uh, I've been doing it intentionally since I was really, really young. And I that's what I encourage people to do because then they have a goal. They're not just putting pieces together and light turning on light and and giving it to a handing it to an animator to animate. Their goal is how this should look. Uh, as good as it can, as real as it possibly can. So I don't know, it's hard to explain that, but me coming from a background of, of being able to only shoot a few photos a week and taking a long time, because I, that's all photography could do, couldn't afford any more than that, uh, I think I took, spent a lot of time looking and observing and dreaming about how things would be with effects. And now it's so easy to see them on, on a monitor that I think we've lost that sort of training about how to observe things. You've learned how to use the tools, but maybe not what we should be doing with them. So it sounds like even though the tools and the technology have so vastly changed, it's that curiosity that's at the core. I think so, and, and discipline to be able to, and, and a decision, a, 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 you know, deciding, I want this to look like this mm -hmm. or look like this, not that I'm assembling and passing it on to somebody. See, I you think know. you are Obi-Wan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so sure, much. Sure, yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you for being here talking with us and, and giving us your wisdom. All right, thanks, sir. Sure. This week on the Star Wars Show, Peter sits down with visual effects legend Dennis Murin. 